thank you. Um, this was really a very nice <laughs> introduction. I don't know whether it deserves all of that. Now, I see we shrunk together. Um, it's good and bad. Um, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, I met first time Pierre at a meeting for hip arthroscopy, Per Helmich, and uh, by that time, I, I had the impression we live a little bit in two different worlds, the groin pain world, and then I was the invited speaker about the hip, and I was the hip guy, nobody thought that the hip is quite important. And I think as we have seen yesterday and today, these worlds are merging, and I think we more and more understand that one side can influence the other side. And um, I would like to share with you my two talks, our original work, this is the first talk, um, on a population-based study in Switzerland. Swiss people are Caucasians. They are, I would say, very special. Um, but uh, the hips are European hips. And uh, in my second talk, I would like to talk then where we are today with our knowledge about impingement. Now that you see that I don't have financial um, disclosures or financial bans, um, I have nothing to, dis to, to disclose. Now when we go back to the concept of femoroacetabular impingement, we know for more than 50 years that structural deformities of the hip, such as the pistol grip, first described in England by, uh, uh, by Stuhlberg and the retro tilt, first described in uh, England by Murray, can lead to osteoarthritis of the hip. And this is not at the age of 70 or 80 years, this is early in life. And most of these deformities are sequela of childhood disease, such as hip dysplasia, called DDH, skiffy, which is slipped capital femoral epiphysis, Perthes disease, and others. Now, it was then about 15 years ago that Professor Gantz published a paper on femoral acetabular impingement as a cause for osteoarthritis of the hip. And in this paper, a novel pathomechanism called FAI was introduced, proposing that most, if not all, osteoarthritis of the hip is secondary, that means has an underlying structural disease, which often is due to very subtle changes of the joint that we have frequently overlooked when we looked at these x-rays. Now, for those of you who are not um, trained in orthopedics and not very familiar with the concept of femoral acetabular impingement, here I show you a couple of pictures um, on a plastic skeleton what it means to have deformities on the acetabular side, which we call acetabular overcoverage, indicated here in red. If you have it on the femoral side, we call this an insufficient offset between the head and neck junction, or you can have combinations of both alterations. And now, if these hips would be always in extension, nothing would happen. But if you add up flexion to this hip, damage will be triggered by this motion. And the more athletic and rigorous this motion is, the more impact you will have on the hip. And if you have an overcoverage of the acetabulum, you have a direct impact of the neck against the rim with damage to the labrum. While if you have a femoral head neck alteration as shown here, this is an inclusion type of injury that means the asphericity dives into the joint, causing high shearing loads on the cartilage with subsequent cartilage degeneration. Or if you have combinations of both deformities, you can have both types of damages. Now, with respect to classification, you have heard maybe about pincer type of impingement. This comes out of the English language. The head is trapped uh, within the acetabular socket, and the range of motion is limited, as you have it in a protrusio type of hip. You can have a non-sphericity at the head-neck junction. This is like an egg, not like a ball, which, when it's moving, um, causes shear forces within the joint or you can have a combination of both. I think the most recent definition, which we have recently published in the AAOS journal, is the MESS definition of femoral acetabular impingement, uh, and it's a clinical entity in which a pathologic mechanical process causes hip pain when morphologic alterations of the femur and acetabulum combined, and here comes sport into play again with vigorous motion especially at the extremes, that is flexion and internal rotation, pivoting maneuvers, 
um, lead to repetitive collisions that damage the soft tissue structures, and this is the labrum and the cartilage within the joint itself. But there is also an association between femoral acetabular impingement and groin pain, together with Brian Kelly from HSS in Boston, uh, in, in New York, and Ashish Bedi. Uh, we wrote a paper where we clearly could show that um, compensatory motion due to abnormal hip kin um, kinematics may adversely affect dynamic muscle forces in the hip region, resulting in secondary abductor groin, lumbar, and pelvic pain syndromes. Though so this is all what we have discussed yesterday. And also there's a high coincidence of athletic pubalgia and symphysial stresses, for example, in soccer players, in patients with FAI, which may result from abnormal motion again due to these restrictions within the hip joint. With respect to femoral acetabular impingement, where are we today? We do know that, pain, that it is painful in young patients uh, where we don't have the option of putting in total hip replacements. We also do know it's a complex deformity which has an interplay with motion. And most of the damage in femoral acetabular impingement occurs at the periphery of the joint, leading um, to secondary osteoarthritis. Now here are some examples from interoperative photographs. This is an open surgery. Here you can see the labrum, which is torn from the acetabular rim, as you have it in pins impingement when the necks collide with the rim. Here you can see a ganglion within the labrum, between the labrum, which is here, and the acetabular cartilage, here would be the femoral head. And in chem type of impingement, which we consider to be much more aggressive to the joint, you frequently find an intact labrum, as shown here, uh, this open case, but you can peel the cartilage away from the subchondral bone, and this is frequently a very severe damage to these hip joints. Now, back in 2004, we were asking the question, what's the prevalence of FAI? And I will talk in the following 10 minutes about the studies we did in our Swiss um, young individuals. We performed in 2004 a population-based cross-sectional study. What does that mean? We looked at patients, at, at individuals, which underwent inscription to the Swiss Army, and these were 1,141 male individuals between 18 and 20 years of age. Almost all of them consented, almost all of them completed the questionnaires, and we only had to exclude 17 because of relevant hip pain, so we wanted really to have asymptomatic young males uh, or those with inflammatory hip disease or previous surgery. Now, when you perform a field study, you need to have reliable assessment tools, and we were very much interested in hip range of motion, specifically flexion and internal rotation, and we um, perform this clinically, as seen today, uh, in the supine position with the hip and the knee flexed at around 90 degrees using a goniometer. Um, we found out, and I will show this data later, that we had a quite high variability between different radars. Therefore, we designed a chair. People frequently laugh. It looks like a torture chair. It's not a torture chair. It's also not an electrical chair. But this chair has two weights of about five kilos, which are then put around the ankle joints, and you then induce external, uh, internal rotation of the hip for 30 seconds, and after equilibrium, you measure internal rotation. What we could clearly show is that the method with the chair, and these are blunt Altman's plots, <laughs> on the x-axis you have internal rotation in degrees, on the y-axis you have the variation between different observers, there was a much lower scattering for the chair method of only five degrees compared to the clinical method with about 15 degrees. We also found a very high correlation between the clinical examination here on the x-axis and the examination chair on the y-axis. Now, with respect to the uh, inter-radar reliability, we clearly found out that we had a moderate um, inter-radar reliability with kappa values between 0.6 and 0.7 for the supine method, but for the test device for the chair, we had an improved um, kappa um, um, 
statistics of around 0.9, which is a very good value. What we also found is, however, that the chair method gives us a little bit higher values for the internal rotation than the clinical methods, and this was 10 degrees, and all the values you will see might be subtracted by 10 degrees for the clinical measurements that are normally performed. This method has been published <coughs> in osteoarthritis uh, and cartilage, and this method was then our method of choice to perform the subsequent studies on the prevalence of CAM FAI in young male patients and also on CAM and PINSA FAI in female patients. These two papers have been published in arthritis care and research and in osteoarthritis and cartilage a couple of years ago. Now, if you look for internal rotation in 1,080 young men and 269 women, we found that women, and all of you know that, are more flexible. They had a mean uh, internal rotation which was about 10 degrees higher than in males. Males had about 35 degrees, females about 45 degrees. But please remember, the chair gives you 10 degrees higher, so it might refer to 25 and 35 degrees. We then had these both normally distributed um, measurements for internal rotation. On the x-axis, again, internal rotations in degrees. On the y-axis, the relevant uh, frequencies. And then we stratified for patients who had a low internal rotation. We considered 30 degrees as a low and 40 as a high uh, internal rotation in both groups and uh, stratified um, these for our MRI measurements. We had a mild oversampling. We had 83 MRIs for those with a low internal rotation because that's the group where we thought we find most of impingement. We also oversampled a little bit for those with a high internal rotation because they might be dysplastic and had a little bit lower um, number of MRIs for those with a normal internal rotation, and this for males and females. Now on MRIs, we measured overall 45 parameters, but I can't report on all of that within uh, 20 minutes. I only want to show you what, what you have all seen. This is a normal femoral head-neck junction. Here you can see some mild cortical alteration, but which we called a uh, grade one alteration, which however is uh, arbitrary if you saw really a cortical reaction like here or a bulging at the head-neck junction as shown here. We called them grade two or grade three alterations um, and these were called definite femoral neck uh, protuberances or FNPs. On the MRIs, we also looked for femoral head fibrocysts, which are first indicators of arthritis and tears within the labrum. Now for the males, what we found is, here you see a femoral head. Here is anterior at 3 o'clock. This is superior at 12 o'clock. This would be posterior. Here is the lesser trochanter. Um, for definitive um, FNPs, that means grade 2 or grade 3, most of them were found anterior superiorly. And that's important because you might not see them on classic x-rays. Followed by anteriorly, this is seen easily on a lateral radiograph and followed by the superior alterations which are seen on AP pelvic views. But you have to keep that in mind that by x-rays, most of your alterations are anterior superiorly and this might escape your detection if you only have uh, two planes to image. For the women, we did not find in any of our females FNPs greater grade one, so we did not find any definitive FNPs. Now, with respect <coughs> to the frequency of FNP in males, if you had a grade two or grade three, remember cortical reaction or really a bulging at the head-neck junction, out of under, uh, our 244 MRIs that we performed, we found in 67, that means 24% of these asymptomatic young people, what we call a chem type of deformity. And if you looked in this cohort into those who had a low internal rotation, again, this is low internal rotation, less than 30 degrees, normal internal rotation, and above 40 degrees, high internal rotation. Young males have a chance of 
50% if they have a low internal rotation to have a chem type deformity. For the females, we did not find in any of our women, and that's also important that there is a gender difference also for the hip, uh, we did not find any definitive FNPs. Now, with respect to the association between FAI and OA, you might ask, you have your deformity, but does that lead to osteoarthritis? We also addressed this question and um, also were able to publish this. We published on the association between chem type deformities and MRI imaging detected structural hip damage. And uh, what we found is that if you have FNPs greater grade two, that means chem deformities, the likelihood to have a femoral neck fibrocyst is uh, between two and three times higher also for labeled tears or intralabeled tears compared to those who don't have this alteration at the head neck junction. So chem deformities can damage the joint. Now with respect to our MRI study, we performed three years after the first study in a, around 200 patients a second series of MRI, not Artra MRI. We were only allowed to perform a um, native MRI. And again, if you look for those who had pain and those who had no pain at that time, we had 177. That means the majority no pain, but 10% developed pain within these three years. And what we could show is that those who had a FNP greater grade two, um, had a <coughs> they were more prevalent in those hips who are patients who develop pain. The same if you had an elevated alpha angle of 62 compared to 54 degrees or 59 to 51 degrees according to Pfirman. Again, if you have chem type of alterations at the head neck junction, you're more likely to develop pain. And the same for fibro, femoral uh, neck fibrocysts or anterolateral tears of the labrum. But I think I have here also a very important figure in those who had no pain three years after the first MRI, we had in 36% by two very experienced radiologists, one is Christian Pfirmann and one is uh, Verlen from, from Switzerland. They reported in 36% of these so-called normal hips, anterolateral label tears. So don't only treat the tear, really look at the patient. Now to summarize my presentation, what are the major findings of uh, this Swiss male and female cohort? We had this nice device, the internal rotation chair with a low measurement error and the high interrater reliability, which enabled us to perform these uh, prevalence studies. If you use the chair, you have to know that it measures a little bit higher values than if you would do it clinically. Uh, in asymptomatic young males, you have an internal rotation on the chair of about 35 degrees, which corresponds to 25 degrees, and in women, 10 degrees higher. Definitive chem type deformities are frequent in asymptomatic males. That's also important. One out of four of our young males had that. And if you had, uh, they had a low internal rotation, they had even a chance of 50% to have a chem type deformity. Label signal intensity changes are also very frequent. So you have to be careful that you don't overinterpret your uh, MRI data. Our cross-sectional and longitudinal associations um, uh, uh, data show associations between chem type impingement, physical activity, I couldn't show this data, MRI changes in pain. And also chem type alterations are really rare in females, suggesting a gender related biomechanically different mechanism between both uh, males and females. Thank you.